If you have your Bibles today and you would join me in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. And we're going to read together the first 12 verses. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the first 12 verses. Amen. And because of our tight environment, I do not ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I believe the Lord will understand. Amen. And the Word of God today reaches, reads from the King James text. <clears throat> now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Uh -huh. And for this cause, what cause, brother? Because they were a bunch of homosexuals? <laughs> because they were a bunch of drunkards? Because they were a bunch of immoral people? No. Why? For this cause. They did not receive a love of the truth. Uh-huh. I want to tell you today, we're in this place this afternoon because we love the truth. That's Hello, right. Right. Yes. Oh, glory yes. to God. Folks, yes. don't make the effort to know God and live for God and serve God if they don't love the truth. Hallelujah. Right. Now listen, I'm almost done reading our primary text. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now you say, well, brother, that sounds pretty heavy duty. No, let me tell you, it started out on a very positive note. And I'll point that out to you in a second, but let's pray first. Father, we love you, God, so much, and we're so grateful, Lord, for the marvelous songs of the church that we've sung this afternoon. Reminding us, Lord, that you are our source, that we come to the house of God to receive from the word of the Lord and to receive from the spirit of the Lord as living waters that never shall run dry. We've come this afternoon, God, to feast at your table and to allow you, Lord, to minister and meet every need in our lives according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Father, you placed a word in my spirit this day. And I ask, Lord, that you would assist me by reason of that great Holy Ghost anointing to preach the word of God, not just to talk it. 
not yes, just to Lord. tell it, yes, but to preach it with conviction and yes, power, Lord. Lord, that the gainsayer might be convinced, Amen. that the unbeliever yes. might be brought to a place of repentance and faith. Oh God, that the believer might be encouraged yes. in their faith this hour. Oh Master, use me, I pray, for I humble myself in your presence. I have nothing to offer outside of you. Grant it, O oh God, for we ask it in that wonderful, wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. Paul begins his this portion of his writing to the church at Thessalonica by saying in verse number 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us why did he say letter as from us he didn't say letter from us uh -huh. because there were people who would write letters and sign them paul the apostle and deliver them in order to assert their view and their opinion you got to remember, this is long before the internet. This is, you know, a time when communication was not easy. That's right. If you wrote a letter, you didn't just put a stamp on it, bring it down to the post office, and drop it in a box. No, you had to hire and pay somebody to carry that letter to its destination. That person had to eat. That person had to stay somewhere while they were traveling. So, honey, if you think the price of a stamp today is high, just imagine. This, you know, this is why I'm amused by people who do not understand the nature of the Bible. They do not understand what this book really is. There are atheists and enemies of God today who will try to say, oh, that's just a man-made book. That's just a book some man uh -huh. sat down and wrote. Honey, I've got news for you. This is a book that dozens of men sat down and wrote. Right. This isn't a book that any one man sat down. This is a book that's, that literally spans centuries. Uh -huh. Many, many centuries yeah. and even millennium. And yet there is a flow. And yet there is consistency. And yet there is continuity. Oh, but I find some inconsistencies in the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as they write of the life and ministry of Jesus. Uh -huh. Do you really? Well, doesn't that tell you then that they didn't sit down together and contrive to tell the same? Same story. So while you're trying to say that the account of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is just a man-made contrived account, I've got news for you. Those inconsistencies are proof that they legitimately sat down and wrote what they saw from their own perspective. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And That's as right. they understood it. So if anything, any little inconsistencies, any little things don't quite match up. All that does is prove there was no conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Hello now. That's right. That's now, right. Mormonism got news for you, folk. Every book they got you studying was written by Joseph Smith. Uh -huh. Every word they got you believing was written by one single man. Not the way God does it. Mm -hmm. Hello, now. That's not the way God does it. I got news for you. God used many men over the course of centuries to give us what we today honor and revere as the Word of God. So Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica and he said to them, I do not want you to be fearful concerning the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. That's right. You see, even at that hour, Tommy, there were preachers who were using the soon coming of Jesus as a fear mechanism. Mm -hmm. Even at that early hour in the life of the church, because all the church knew is that Jesus was coming again. They had no concept as to the time frame. They had no concept as to how much time would pass. So therefore, in their minds, it could be any minute. 
But Paul writes to the Thessalonian church and he says, I do not want you to be fearful. Do not let these preachers, do not let letters, do not let your own spirit cause you to become anxious or to become fearful about the coming of the Lord. Uh -huh. Now listen, children. There's churches out there today, church I grew up in, they went out of their way to scare the bejesus out of everybody that came into the pew. Well, I don't know how many times I went to church and, and we'd be driving home and I was just expecting the trumpet to blow and I was expecting to be translated up to glory at any second. That preacher had me convinced, brother. I'm going to tell you, there is a danger. Uh-huh. There is a danger in doing that. Uh -huh. The church has hurt itself by doing this. Mm -hmm. An apocalyptic message, the Jehovah's Witnesses have built their entire organization on an apocalyptic message. If you look at the cover of many of their Watchtower and Awake magazines, you know, it basically is like a bearded man in a sheet out on Main Street carrying a sign, the end is near. That's what their magazine covers look like. Because, boy, they're sounding the trumpet. Whoa, everything's about to wind up, boy. Everything's about to finish up. Well, when you do that, you... Place fear and anxiety in people. People do not like fear and anxiety. I'm going to tell you a little secret. God don't like it either. The Word of God said, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. That's right. God does not operate through fear, folks. Uh -uh. That is not God's preferred method of operation. And when the church uses that tool, it is using a tool that God has not made available to you. So where'd you get it from? Uh -huh. And when you embrace an apocalyptic message and every sermon you preach and every word that comes out of your mouth is uh, laced with warnings of this apocalypse which is about to occur at any moment. Uh -huh. Well, time passes and all of a sudden that person's fear obviously begins to subside. You might have had them shaking in their boots while they were in the church house. You might have had them shaking in their boots while they were in the kingdom hall. But after a while, you know, life goes on and everything seems normal and the same. And that fear begins to subside. And they're looking and they're waiting and they're looking and they're waiting and they're looking and they're waiting and, they're and, they're waiting and nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, people grow very weary of hearing that same wolf cry. Remember the story of the little boy that cried wolf? Well, every Sunday, they're going to church to hear the preacher cry wolf. That's what it feels like. And after a while, you get tired of hearing that. Paul said, I'm going to tell you, this, this troubles me that the Word of God is so clear on these things, uh -huh. and yet the church is so contrary to these things. Amen. Listen to what Paul said. First of all, he said, don't be shaken. Don't be soon shaken in mind or be troubled, with neither by spirit nor by word nor by a letter from us. By spirit. I'll tell you, the devil loves to torment people. Oh, I had dreams, and all I saw was destruction and fire, and all I saw was Armageddon, and all I saw, oh, I'll tell you, the enemy loves to torment people. He'll torment yes. you till you kill yourself. Literally. The enemy will torment your mind until you commit suicide. He loves to torment people, brother. Yes. Paul said, don't be soon troubled by word or by spirit. So even if spiritual forces are trying to trouble you, they're not coming from God. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me today? I hope you're hearing me today. Uh -huh. Or by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Listen now, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Ooh, that's clear. That's pretty strong language. Amen. Don't let anybody tell you any different. Uh -huh. Then he continues. For that day shall not come. 
except there come a falling away first. And, and is a big word. Because it means don't you dare take this part and ignore the next part. Because the first part and the second part go together. There's going to be a great falling away and something else also is going to transpire before the coming of the Lord. What is that second thing? He's Listen. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. i got news for you, children. Don't let anybody make you fearful about the coming of the Lord. Does this preacher believe Jesus is coming? You better believe I do. Do I preach Jesus is coming? You better believe I do. That's what the Word of God says, and I won't tell you what the Word of God says. But do not be troubled. Do not be fearful. There are very specific events Paul said that must first come to pass. One of them is the church is going to experience a major shakeup. It's called persecution. And when this happens, everybody that's playing games with God is going to drop off the tree like a dead leaf. Everybody whose faith Lisa is not sincere and is not real. They're going to fall by the wayside. There will be a great falling away. Uh -huh. We've had a lot of preachers and we've had a lot of teachers try to say, well, bless God, we're seeing that in the church world today. So many people are backsliding. Honey, let me tell you, when what Paul is talking about happens, you're going to know it's what Paul was talking about. Because there aren't going to be a great number of backsliders. The majority in the church are going to backslide. Amen. Uh -huh. And the tribulation, the torment the church will experience, i got news for you, it's brought in upon itself. This mic's wanting to mess up, and it's brand new. <laughs> There's going to be a great falling away, Paul said, he said, and also, as well, that man, that son of perdition, will be revealed. And, listen, he is going to set himself up in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Well, I've got news for you. The temple of God does not stand this afternoon. That's right. It needs to be rebuilt. So what are you so worried about? Does that mean Jesus isn't coming? Does that mean you can be like a daisical in your faith? No, 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 don't, don't play that game. I've said it before and I'll say it again, honey. If you don't go into tribulation and trouble and trials having faith, don't think you're going to find it once you get into the fire. That's right. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had faith before they ever faced the fire, and that's why they came out on the other side. Daniel had faith before he ever faced the lion's den, and that's why he came out of the lion's den. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? I want you to understand, you don't wait till you're in the lion's den to call on God, because all you're going to wind up is being a sanctified supper. That's right. That's right. Too many people think, well, bless God, I can play games. You know, I can be lackadaisical. I'll wait until I see some of these signs coming to pass. And then I'll run for the church. Oh, no, you won't. You'll get so happy in your sinful, unbelieving lifestyle. You'll get so comfortable doing things the way you've been doing them that even though you see the signs of the time, even though you see the Antichrist on that international television and you know good and bloody well who he is and what he's up to, right. you'll still want to keep doing things the way you've been doing them. No, I'm going to be ready. Hallelujah to God. I'm going to make sure that I go in this thing ready. Be ready for whatever the devil wants to throw at the church. Yeah. Glory to 
God. Amen, Too many brother. people are not in the house of God this afternoon who should be in the house of God. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll wait. Oh, not a good idea. Not, Not a good idea, honey. We are too close to the end of this thing. I'm telling you. I spoke to a Jewish gentleman years ago in New York City. His name happened to be the same as mine, Charles. They called him Charlie. And Charlie and I were talking, and I told him about the oneness position of the Godhead. And I explained to him, I said, you are probably, being Jewish, you're probably of the belief that all Christians embrace the Trinitarian definition of God. Well, they do, don't they? I said, no, sir, they do not. So let me tell you what we believe. And I begin to explain to him. I said, we, oh, hallelujah. I said, we believe the Messiah was Jehovah God Almighty yeah. manifested in yeah. human form in order to do for humanity what humanity could not do for itself. He came to be the Lamb, like Abraham said to Isaac, Oh son, don't worry. God will provide himself a sacrifice. If God has to come down from heaven and get on this altar, he is not going to let me take your life. Believe me. That's what Abraham was saying to Isaac. He said, God will sooner allow himself to be sacrificed on this altar than he'd allow me to sacrifice you. Why? Because God never brought breaks his promise. He never breaks his That's word. Right. He said that through Isaac, over and over again, God made promises to Abraham, and he specifically said, he didn't say through thy offspring, or through thy son, because then it could be any offspring, it could be any son. But no, God purposely said to Abraham, over and over again, through Isaac will all the nations of the world be blessed. So Abraham knew that God's asked me to take my kid up to the top of this mountain and sacrifice him. And I'll play the game. I'll go through the motions. But I know God. And God does not ever contradict himself. He does not ever break his promise or break his word. And if he has to come down from heaven in the form of a lamb and leap on that altar, he will do so. And that was a foreshadowing and a foretelling of the coming of the Lamb of God who would be nothing less than God himself. Mm -hmm. The fullness of the divine nature dwelleth in him bodily. Hallelujah to the Lamb of glory. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. I said to Charlie all these things and he literally stood there with tears in his eyes and he looked at me and he said, oh my God, oh my God. I said, what's wrong? He said, I could believe that. That does not contradict my Jewish teaching. I said, of course it doesn't. The early church was comprised of Jews. They all believed on this gospel. But I got news for you. I don't care what First Baptist Church tells you. I don't care what First Episcopal Church tells you. Or Brother Martin, sorry to offend, but you know, First Lutheran Church tells you. The reality is, they were not preaching the Trinity back then. They were not preaching the Trinity at Pentecost. Because had they been, the Jews would have rejected their message flatly. Yep. That's not the message they were preaching. No. Charlie looked at me and said, I could believe every word you're saying. Everything you've just said, it meshes with Judaism. It meshes with Jewish teaching. I said, of course it does. That's the whole point. We were talking and at one point I said to him, I said, can I tell you today what one of the signs of the return of the Messiah is. I said one of the greatest signs that Messiah is about to return. Now, you Jewish folks think he's going to show up for the first time. We Christian folks know he's already made one appearance. He's just coming back for the encore. Yeah. I said, but do you know what one of the biggest signs of his return that we're looking for today is? I said, we're waiting for the rebuilding of the temple. In Jerusalem. I said, oh, I'm going to tell you, the day they announce that they're going to rebuild that temple, 
you're going to hear me shout from Texas to New York, honey, because the clock will begin to tick. I'm telling you the truth, folks. The clock will begin to tick at that very moment. And you will know as a child of God, let me tell you something, God always informs his people. Said, behold, I do a new thing, but before I do it, I will tell thee of it. See, God doesn't do nothing except his people are informed. We're not in a marriage where the husband knows stuff that he don't tell the wife. Oh, hallelujah. We're not in a marriage where the bridegroom knows something he won't tell the bride. No, the bridegroom keeps the bride informed. <coughs> That's why Amen. Paul wrote what he wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So that the bride, the church, could be informed. There is no need for unnecessary worry. There is no That's need right. for unnecessary fear. There is no need for unnecessary anxiety. But there is need for preparation. That's right. That's right. You do need to prepare yourself. You need to prepare yourself spiritually. For what's coming. Well, I want to tell you now. In Matthew chapter 24, <clears throat> quite a large portion of Scripture, beginning at verse number 3 through verse 21. Let's see, I can show it to you here. If I can get it. There we go. This goes through verse 9 and then the rest. The Word of the Lord said, and as he, meaning Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Uh -huh. hmm. Have you heard that phrase before? Isn't that exactly what Paul said in 2 yep. Thessalonians chapter 2? said, don't let anybody deceive you. This is going to happen first. This has to happen first. Okay? Now Jesus is using the same identical language. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying... I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Again, we have the Lord, just like Paul, saying, Don't be troubled. Do you see what I'm telling you? See, Jesus didn't preach an apocalyptic message that was designed to scare the devil out of you. That's right. No, he said, no, this, this is very pragmatic. This is very simple. If you understand these things have got to come to pass first, then you can go into this thing informed mm -hmm. and fearless. That's right. Are you hearing me today? When you know, when God has given you all this information, why? what do you have to worry about? I grew up in the Assembly of God Church. Every time something happened that even remotely looked like a sign of the Lord's return, everybody in First Assembly of God Church had a stroke. Ooh. Yep. Oh, Jesus! Oh, God! You'd think somebody had attached electrodes to their toes and zapped them with 10,000, you know, volts of electricity. It's like... Why are you screaming and hollering about the signs of the Lord's return mm -hmm. as though you're scared out of your mind? You ought to be jumping yeah. up in church and doing a jig. Yeah. You should be shouting the glory down. Yeah. You should be rejoicing. Yeah. No! He's about to break through the eastern sky. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good yeah. Lord have mercy. What's wrong with the church? But you see, when you use fear, you reap what you sow. Uh -huh. You get fear. Uh -huh. If I today get up in front of you and I preach a message that sows into you confidence, if I get up and I sow into you fearlessness, 
If I get up and I sow into you peace, then you're going to walk out of here and have confidence and fearlessness and peace. Am I telling the truth? Well, that's, oh, that's right. what this preacher's got to plant. Uh -huh. So look forward to reaping that in the future. Jesus continues and says, Take heed that no man deceive you. Verse 4. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers or unusual places. Yeah. And these are the beginning of sorrows. That means the expectant mother is beginning to experience contractions. But we know, Lisa, don't we, when mommy starts to have her contractions, that doesn't necessarily mean the baby is imminent. Doesn't mean the baby's going to be there any second. Nope. Means the baby's coming. Could be hours. Uh -huh. In some instances, some ladies begin to experience contractions. It could be days uh -huh. before that baby arrives. The Lord said, these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. In verse then number uh, 8, he said, All these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9, chapter 24, Matthew. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Let me tell you a little secret. When Jesus uses the term you, Speaking to his apostles and his disciples, that is a collective you for the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, God's church is one church. We're part of the same identical church Paul was part of. That's We're right. part of the same identical church Peter was in. Yep. They, they, the church of Jesus Christ is not divided up according to eras and time frames. Uh -uh. No, we're all part of the same church. Seeing then you are compassed by so great a cloud of witnesses. We are all part of one singular church. That's right. And when the Lord spoke to his apostles and disciples and said, You, he, everything you read and saying in that context applies to you and I as well. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because he's speaking to the church. You'll notice when he speaks of the world, he'll say, They. <laughs> He always draws a distinction. He doesn't say, you shall look upon him whom you pierce. No, no, no. Right. He said, they shall look upon him whom they pierce. That way, yes. That's right. Because he's speaking of the world. He's speaking of those that are lost. Let's continue. In verse number, uh, well, let me, verse 9 again, Matthew 24. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now Paul said, before the Lord comes, there'll be a great falling away. Here in Matthew 24, Jesus is explaining the cause of the falling away. Mm -hmm. You're following? Uh -huh. He said, when you turn up the heat of persecution, when people begin to live their lives without God and without morality and decency and they just do any old way they want to do, he said, because of this, the love of many will wax cold. There's your cause of the falling away. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. Amen. Now listen. He goes on to say. And these false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, verse 12, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. 
So he says, until, remember what I said before about God has promised that every ear will have an opportunity to hear this gospel. Yep. Mm -hmm. Jesus ain't coming till every tribe and every tongue on this planet has heard this message. That's why the United Pentecostal Church, bless their heart, is, is working itself to death in the missions department trying to get this message. That's why the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith, that's why the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World is sending missionaries. That's why Bible Way Churches International is sending missionaries. These are all one God, Jesus name churches. I'm going to tell you a little secret, friend. That's the message the Lord's talking about. He ain't talking about any message. Mm -hmm. He said this gospel. He meant the gospel he set forth, not the gospel man created. That's right. Say, well, bless God, the Baptist church got missionaries in 355 countries around the world. Well, glory to God, the UPC's only got them in 175. So guess what? That means this message hasn't gotten to every tribe and every nation and every tongue yet. A message may have. Uh-huh. Amen. Push this ahead for you so you can follow me. He said, but now the end is coming. Now the end is coming. Listen now, because now he tells us what the end looks like. Verse number 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place whoso readeth let him understand let them then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Brother, Jesus speaks of the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. That is the second part of what Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The first part, you remember, he said there'd be a great falling away. Now the Lord has articulated how that falling away is going to happen and why. Now he's referring to the that's the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. That is the second part of what Paul talked about concerning the son of perdition would be revealed, the Antichrist. They're both saying the same identical thing. The Lord's going into a little bit more detail about some things. He explains, he doesn't just say there's going to be a falling away. He tells you why there's going to be a falling away. Do you follow what I'm telling you? But then he also goes on to say, that when this occurs, he said at that point, his return is right then. Mm -hmm. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. The Word of God declares, Paul told us in 2 Thessalonians, that Antichrist is going to walk into the restored temple in Jerusalem. He is going to literally go to that part of the temple which is called the Holy of Holies. Nobody has legitimate access to the Holy of Holies except for the high priest of Israel. Even he is taking his life into his hands to walk past that curtain. As the representative of Israel, he used to tie bells about his waist. Mm -hmm. And they tied a rope that went around his belly. And if they heard, all of a sudden, if they heard those bells stop jingling, they then they hauled him out because they knew he was dead. dead. 
if Israel's sin was so great that God would not receive the offering that that high priest brought into that sacred space. You see, the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant resides. And the Ark of the Covenant was a piece of furniture that God himself designed. And he gave instructions to Israel as to how to construct this piece of furniture that they were to carry with them everywhere they went because this piece of furniture represented his very throne. Mm -hmm. Wherever that piece of furniture was, wherever that ark was, God was. Even in Old Testament times when the enemy got hold of it, They wound up yielding the blessing of God's presence. Because that ark, God said, where that ark is, I am. So you better guard it with your life. You better reverence it. I'm going to tell you, too many people have no reverence and no respect for where the presence of the Lord is. Right. We got people nowadays want to come into the church house, brother, carrying soda pops and chewing gum. And, oh, it's cool. God's cool. God's good with all this. Wear your cowboy hats. Wear this. Wear that. Do this. Do that. No, 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 no. When you come into the presence of the Almighty, when you come into the house of God, I'm old-fashioned enough, and I'm not ashamed to say it, to still believe you ought to dress right, you ought to act right, you ought to look right, right, you ought to be right. Mm -hmm. There ought to be enough of a fear of God in you. Enough of a respect and a reverence for God in you to not come into the place where the presence of the Lord is carelessly. The temple is going to be rebuilt and the Jews are going to be able to resume the proper exercise of their religion which includes animal sacrifice. The abomination of desolation, that term literally means an abomination that is so great it is going to unleash <laughs> desolation and destruction. That's what that term means, the abomination of desolation. It, 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 you know, we hear the word abomination tossed around all the time. But God said this particular abomination is going to be of such an enormous magnitude that it is literally going to unleash desolation and destruction. It is going to unleash the judgment of God. Let me tell you a little good news. The word gospel means good news. Let me tell you a little good news. According to the word of God, God will not judge the righteous with the wicked. So guess what has to happen? If God's going to open a can of whoop butt on the world, if he's going to open a can of whoop butt on the Antichrist and on the unbelieving world, he's got to get you and me out of the way. He ain't going to whip his kids while trying to whip the enemy. Hello now. He's not going to destroy his own while trying to destroy the enemy. No, 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 no. The church will be taken out of the way. That's why Jesus said that this man is going to go into the Holy of Holies and declare himself to be God. And Paul said in 2 uh, Thessalonians that this man was going to do this very thing. But Jesus said, when you see this, when this happens... This is the very end, folks. This is the end. This is it. This is the final act. He said at that point, if you're on a housetop, don't even worry about going down into the house to get something. If you're out in the field, don't worry about going back to the house to get something. You don't have time. Hallelujah. Right. The thief in the night is going to strike. Woo! Oh, glory to God. And like lightning from the east to west. He's going to gather his people up out of this world. And in that very moment, literally, the very moment that the church of the Most High and Living God is taken from this world, God is going to unleash judgment. Jesus said, like this planet has never seen. It's called the tribulation. Now I got news for you. We've already been... Before this transpires, we will have already been in tribulation. The word tribulation literally <laughs> means judgment. 
The Word of God teaches us judgment must first begin at the house of God. See, God's got to clean up the church. The scripture tells us He's coming for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. He's he ain't coming from some old skanky broad who looks like death, who's got the world all over her, who's got the world's ideas and the world's attitudes and the world's mentality. Hello, now that's not what He's coming for. No, it said He's coming for those that love. His appearing. So I'm going to tell you, there's a reason God gives us the information that He gives us. There's a reason God gives us the information about His return that He gives us. Honey, I'm going to tell you something. The closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more you're going to want it. Yep. See, right now, you sit there and you say, well, there's God. If Jesus came today, I don't know if I'd really even want it to happen today, per se. You know, i got all this other going on in my head and in my heart and in my life and in my spirit. But I'm going to tell you something. Just like a pregnant woman, by the time she'd been carrying that big old bowling ball around in her belly for nine months, she ready. She's ready. She said, oh, God, Lord Jesus, please. Get this thing out of me. Am I telling the truth, Lisa? That's going to be the church. By the time all the signs have been fulfilled that Jesus gave us and Paul told us about, we're going to be so ready for the rapture, it's not even funny. You ain't going to want nothing but the rapture. You are going to be so tired of this world and this life and the trouble and the struggle that you're going to welcome the Lord's return. And you're going to be looking up in the sky and saying, Oh, Lord, is it going to be today? Oh, Jesus, is it going to be today? Now listen, if the temple's rebuilt in Jerusalem and the Jews have gone back to sacrificing their animals, it could be any day. Uh-huh. But the Antichrist, Jesus told us the Antichrist would go into the temple and declare himself to be God. Paul told us, brother, mm -hmm. before the coming of the Lord. Amen. Mark chapter 13, verses 13 through 16. You know what I've told you how many times? The principle of God's word. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Mark confirms what Matthew wrote. In Matthew 24, when Mark writes, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, when you shall say, who is you? The church. Believers. True, biblical, born-again Christians. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. Why? Because that's the moment. Hallelujah. That's the time. Right that moment. See, we don't have to be fearful of the Lord's return. He's given us all the information we need. He has not given us, you know, I'm going to tell you, growing up the way I did in the Assemblies of God, I hate to use their name and embarrass them, but they, they brought it on themselves. Now, I'm not going to pick on your church if I'm not willing to pick on mine <laughs> that I grew up in. But, you know, brother, I mean, you know, oh, the Bible said there'd be Wars and rumors of wars. Oh, there'd be earthquakes. There'd be this. There'd be that. You know, blah, 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 blah. and every time something was in the paper, oh, see, there's a sign. The Lord's return is nigh. No, He said these are the beginning of sorrows. Come on, fool, read the whole book. I get so sick and tired of Christians who read what they want to read and ignore what they want to ignore. I'm tired of it. I'm flat out tired of it. 
No, Jesus said those things would be the beginning of sorrow. Honey, those are just the contractions starting. That doesn't mean the Lord's about ready to give birth. That doesn't mean the church is going to be redeemed at that moment in time. That doesn't mean we're even close to it. Jesus said, don't be troubled, don't be worried. These are the beginning of sorrows. He said, no, there's a lot more. And he's given us all the information we need. And as we see these things happen, the church is going to be going through a shakeup. It's going to be going through a judgment. It's going to be going through tribulation. But you want to know the funny thing about the church? The true church. Those whose hearts are not true will fall off the tree like a dead leaf. Those whose hearts are true. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Outside of me, you can't do nothing. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Those who are true, those whose faith is real, you're going to see them doing things that haven't been done in many, many years. When you turn the heat up on the church, you know what happens to the church? The church gets on fire. But it burns with a fire from heaven that does not consume. Hallelujah to God. All of a sudden, you're going to see the church once again. Laying hands on the sick and they shall recover. You're going to see the church once again casting out demons in Jesus' name. You're going to see the church once again raising the dead, cleansing the leper. Oh, children, I want to tell you, because those that are plugged into the vine are finally, when you turn the heat up, all of a sudden you grab even closer. You hold on even tighter. And when they begin to hold on even tighter, God is going to begin to be able to flow through his people. He's going to be able to function through his people like he hasn't been able to function through them in many, many, many years. <laughs> and you're going to see a revival of the power of God Amen. in God's people. Amen. In spite of the tribulation, in spite of the torments of persecution, God's people are going to be full of joy. And they're going to be looking with anticipation and hope for the coming of the Lord. Oh, I want to tell you today. When these writers, Jesus spoke of the abomination of desolation. Mark spoke of the abomination of desolation. Matthew spoke of the abomination of desolation. And they all referred to the fact that this was relative to prophecy found in the book of Daniel. I would be remiss this afternoon if I did not read to you that prophetic statement in the book of Daniel, wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, the word of God speaks of the Antichrist and says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week... How long is a week? Seven days. The tribulation, according to the word of God, how long is the tribulation going to last? Seven years. This prophecy, Daniel speaking, the, the weeks, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, week that he refers to, he's speaking of the tribulation period, that seven year period. He said, in the midst of the week, which the middle of a week would be at the three and a half day mark. He said, at the midst of the week, this is when the Antichrist makes his move. Listen, at the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So in other words, He's allowed the temple to be rebuilt. As a matter of fact, I believe the Antichrist is going to be the cause for the temple being able to be rebuilt. Because it, it's going to take something supernatural to have that happen. But all of a sudden, he's going to walk into the temple and say, okay, no more sacrifice. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, no, no. We had a deal. We had a deal with you that we'd be able to practice our faith according to the tradition and according to the teaching of Holy Scripture. Yeah, well, you might as well stop because you're sacrificing to a false god. 
What? What are you talking about? And then he's going to walk into the Holy of Holies and say, the only God that should be sacrificed on this planet is me. This all occurs when, Brother Jack? The midst of the week. That's why I believe in what's referred to as a mid-tribulation. Rapture. Not pre, not post. Mid-tribulation rapture. The first half of the tribulation is a period of judgment that is designed to shake up and purify the church. The second half of the tribulation is going to shake up the world. And I'm going to tell you, if you think that you can sit out the house of God and you can sit out Christian service and living for Jesus today and I'll just wait and bless God if I wind up here after the Lord's come, well, I'll just be a Christian then. <laughs> I'm not even going to go into the horrors that the Word of God did. The Lord Jesus said it'd be a time of tribulation such as the world has never seen nor will ever see. In other words, there'll never be a repeat of it. It's going to be the climax. It's going to be the final chapter in the life of humanity. You see, Tommy, that's why the Jehovah's Witnesses are preaching a false doctrine. And Paul said, let no man deceive you. That's why the Jehovah's Witnesses are preaching a false doctrine. And uh, Matthew said that Jesus said, let no man deceive you. The Lord said, no, all of these things are going to happen first. Even if you try to bypass the doctrine of the rapture, these things would all have to come to pass before the, quote, new kingdom order came into being. That's right. That's right. They're not teaching that, are they? No. They're scaring the bejesus out of people, trying to tell them that Jehovah's new kingdom is going to appear tonight, possibly. It's going to appear tomorrow, possibly. It's about to happen any minute. You see, that same fear technique, that same, I'm not here today. I hope you have, you haven't tapped into fear, have you? I think if anything, God willing, you've tapped into hope. Amen. Because you realize that, yeah, the Lord's coming. And whatever trials, whatever struggles the church may face during that first portion of the tribulation period, folks, we're going to have the Spirit of God with us in a special way like we've never had the Spirit of God. Right. You see, I'm going to tell you a little secret. I'm trying to finish, but I'm struggling a little bit. Martin, you hush. <laughs> you want a plant to be fruitful. You want a plant to really produce fruit. What do you do with it, Brother Jack? Well, you fertilize it. You prune it. Anything on that plant that ain't alive and well, you cut off. You see, the first portion of the tribulation, there's going to be that shaking. The Word of God said the heavens will be shaken. He said God won't shake things up so much that there ain't going to be nothing left. That if it's loose, it's going to fall. Well, once God has shaken the tree of life and shaken the church, himself being the vine, we being the branches, once he's shaken that up, Rose, and all the dead weight has fallen off, guess what you've got? you got a tree that is capable of bearing fruit. <laughs> you've got a tree that is capable. I've said it many times, and I'll say it again. I know a lot of preachers. I, you know, I'm the Donald Trump of the church community. I don't know that that's a good thing, but that's the truth. I'll say it. It'll come off my lips, whether it's good sometimes or bad. I'll say, <laughs> say what I think, and I think what I say. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. I've said this many times. Jack can tell you. Tommy can tell you. Anybody been in our church for any length of time can tell you. There are many times when people have left our church and I have said, let them go. Yep. Don't you dare go chasing them and begging them to come to church. Don't you know why? They're not bringing anything to the table. They're not sincere. They come to church so they can go out and meet with us afterwards. You follow what I'm saying? 
they come to church because they know we're going to buy them a free hamburger after church. That's the only reason they're there. It's the only reason they're here. And I know that no plant can prosper unless like the <coughs> people of God in the second chapter of the book of Acts. And they were all with one accord in one place. You want to see God's church performing miracles? You want to see great things happening? You get a group of people who are in one accord in one place. I'm going to tell you, the enemy makes sure that he sows people into every church who are there for every reason but the right reason. Uh -huh. And he does it on purpose because he knows he can hamper their fruitfulness. Did you hear what I said? Yep. And I know too many pastors that let that foolishness go on. I don't. You ain't here for the right reason. If you're not here with the desire for a move of God, if you're not here with the desire to learn and to grow and to develop in your walk with God, then honey, there's a hundred churches in Dallas you can go to that'll be thrilled to death to have you. This ain't one of them. Amen. That's right. I'm looking, I want to be an Acts 2 church. Amen. Amen. I want to look just like the church you read about in the second chapter of the book of Acts. And I know we can't get there if we got half the people in the pews that are sitting around thinking, well, I don't really believe this. I don't really believe that. I don't really like this. I don't really like that. But the pastor buys me a meal after church, so I'll come to church just for a free meal. Uh -uh. No, that don't fly. You'll see God use this little church greater than he's used some of the biggest churches in this city. Because as few as we've got, we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Lastly, this evening, or this Jesus. afternoon, let me finish reading Daniel 9.27. Uh, it says that he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So he's breaking his covenant. See, he's made a contract. He's made an agreement with Israel for seven years. But in the midst of the week, he breaks that contract and said, No, I've decided I want you guys to quit doing this. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. What does consummation mean? It's when it all comes to a head. That's you know when it all finishes up. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Lastly, I want to share with you this afternoon the most hopeful, the happiest, the most exciting promise from the Word of God that you'll ever hear. A lot of times you go to funerals and you hear preachers read this. But understand it today in the context of life and not death. Paul writes and says, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now the Jehovah's Witnesses will try to tell you that there are classes of people within the kingdom of God. I won't even go into how they determine this. You talk about a screwball mess. Paul said, we won't all sleep. What did I tell you about these types of pronouns? You, we. It's talking about the church. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. Not the anointed class. We all shall be changed. For in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye of the last trump, 
For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption. And this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, here's his final admonishment. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Yeah, the end is near. I can declare that and Shout it from the rooftop. And yet I am not trying to inspire the fear. The anxiety that some others would try to inspire this afternoon. No, our message is rather exciting. The end is near. But do not fear. Hallelujah. The end is near, but do not fear. God's given us all the information we need. We know what's coming. We know what to expect. Yeah. Yeah. We know what's going to happen. We know yeah. how he's going to do it. And we know that when it's all over, he's taking us home. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God, he's taking us home. Yeah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord.